Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Getting the Results You Want from Your Inclusion and Diversity Training. I'm Sunny Lee Goodman, and I'm the lead consultant for inclusion and diversity at Lapin International. We're delighted to have you join us, and we're so excited about the content that we'll be showing today. Today's webinar should run about 45 minutes, depending on Q&A. And if any of you are currently experiencing any technical issues, just drop us a note using that questions pane, which is on your dashboard to the right. And we'll work behind the scenes to help you um, fix your problem. And also, if you have any questions during the course of our presentation, please go ahead and write down your questions in that same pane. And we'll hopefully be able to get to it during the Q&A section. We will also be recording today's session, so each of you will receive a link of the replay. You should be getting that tomorrow. So for those of you who do not know us, Lapin International is a boutique consulting firm, and we work on strengthening organizations from within through purpose-driven strategy and value-based leadership. And DNI is one of our, we believe that DNI is one of our core leadership capacities and an integral part of leadership development. This is something we have been integrating into our work, starting in South Africa and um, using it in a world context for the last 25 years. So having said that, let me introduce uh, my co-presenter for today. This is Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Forlenza. Michael and I often present together. He, um, you will find him to be a very insightful person with an incredible amount of um, information um, as well as insight into human nature. So Michael is our uh, senior consultant at Lapin International. His primary focus is on leadership development through transformational leaning and, uh, learning and adult development. He's also a practitioner of mindfulness and mental training, positive psychology and neuroscience, and systems thinking for complex adaptive system. He's also the former assistant dean in the School of Leadership and Professional Advancement at Duquesne University and co-founder and former executive director of the Professional Coach Certification Program at Duquesne. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Sunny. I'd also like to introduce all of you to my colleague and my good friend, Sunny Lee Goodman. Inclusion and diversity work has been a core focus of Sunny's professional career for almost her entire um, working life. Prior to joining Lapin International, she was the director of the Tools for Tolerance Program for Law Enforcement at the Simon Wiesenthal Center at the Museum of Tolerance. In that capacity, she developed and delivered <clears throat> programming for over 150,000 criminal justice professionals and other leaders, both nationally and internationally. She also was one of the principal developers of the award-winning Perspectives on Profiling interactive CD-ROM. Welcome, Sunny. Thanks, Michael. So before we get started, it would be great if we could take a little poll. We're gonna engage you and work with you during the course of the, uh, don't think you can sit back and just listen. <laughs> In other words, we'd like to engage you with a little poll asking you to tell us what best describes your organization inclusion and diversity journey. So select one of the following. We are at the very beginning of our journey. We have a strategy but need implementing we have implemented but need help overcoming some obstacles, or is IND values that are already lived in our culture? Please choose one. Be able to get uh, the results from the poll. There we go. All right, so I guess that we're all just beginning to get into the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> We'll come back to uh, more interactive polls later in the session. Thank you very much. If we can bring back the slides. Yep. 
so as we move along, this topic of IND for me is more than in a professional capacity. For me, I feel like it's been a lifelong journey. I can remember when I was eight years old, I watched the miniseries Roots. And it had a profound effect on me because it was one of the first times that I saw people being treated differently for the color of their skin. And it kind of meshed with my own experience going through elementary school. And I've had um, the ability to pursue this kind of interest throughout college and into graduate school. And then I had the privilege of being able to live um, in, in this field professionally when I was at the Museum of Tolerance. When I joined in 1996, um, Los Angeles had just experienced the Rodney King incident, and we had gone through the Los Angeles riots. And so I was brought in to do professional development training for police officers on cultural diversity and sensitivity training. And at that time, it was a very um, dynamic time. We learned a lot. But what struck me was one of our grantors asked us, wouldn't it be helpful if we gave our officers a rule book, the top 10 ways to treat an African American, top 10 ways to treat a Asian American or a Latino. And it struck me at that time that that was probably not a good way to go. Well, I hope that since that time, we've come farther away and changed the paradigm at how we see diversity. But yesterday, as it happens, I saw an article on a website called sci.org in which the title of the article said that study of diversity training suggests that it doesn't lead to much change. So I read further, and what really stood out for me is how they defined diversity training. It said that at its core, diversity training is about teaching employees the rules involved in the treatment of people that are different from them. So for example, you should teach them how not to be a racist or how not to treat women as second-class citizens. I had thought we had gone a lot further beyond that, but apparently not. So it gave me pause and time to think about, in my 22 years of professional experience, what kind of insights could I help um, provide to people who are engaged in this issue? So I came up with three things uh, to think about. First, first insight, that inclusion and diversity are not problems to be solved, but mm -hmm. rather a journey of growth and development. There's going to be no simple solutions to these complex problems that can be trained away. And certainly, certainly it's not going to be about mastering any set of rules or checkoff boxes. This, this is about development. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be linear either, that each individual organization is going to have forge its own way. And with today's focus on intersectionality, in which people get to choose um, their identity across different categories, this journey is really going to be determined by the people in the organization. The second insight is that this journey is going to require preparation so that people don't def um, default into defensiveness. I think we make an assumption that people can have these conversations, that they're prepared to do so. Um, and conversation is the key skill, but what we've discovered um, over time is that people are not prepared to have them. In our leadership work, we know that leaders have difficulty having uncomfortable conversations about performance evaluations. I could only imagine how much harder it is when you're talking about people's values and identities. We really need to prepare people with stronger listening skills and the ability to engage at a different level. And because we are human, I guarantee we're all going to make a mistake. And so we also need to learn how to recover from our mistakes and how to repair those broken relationships. The third insight is that let's not try to change people's minds, but rather create the conditions to expand their perspectives. I can't tell you how many pe times people have come up to me before a class and said, you know what, you can't change me. And my response is usually, you're right. It's not my job to change you but I can help you create the opportunity to learn more, to grow yourself. Now, I can't think of a more challenging or triggering into defensiveness topics in training law enforcement than racial profiling. And, you know, officers used to come into our class 
with their body so tight um, and vibrating with defensiveness. But I think we surprised them because we didn't give them what they expected. I think what they expected to be told that they were wrong, that they needed to change. Instead, what we did is we started with where they are, they were, and helped them to grow their perspectives. We challenged them to think a little bit broader. We challenged them to try to find some blind spots in what and how they were dealing with the issue. We didn't force the change. We just asked them to grow. And I knew we were doing something important that first time when an officer came up after class and said to me, you know what, I think I may have been racially profiling during my career. So then let's just take a look at the current state of what we see is IND training. So we think that people often make the objective of inclusion and diversity training an improved collaboration between people of different perspectives and backgrounds. However, when we've done our research, we know that IND training sometimes triggers defensiveness in, particip in participants and resulting in often less collaboration. And what do we think is the reason why? And we believe it's because the participants have not been prepared for honest conversation, to grow themselves and their self-awareness, and to push for that personal growth. And here lies the key. This is the missing link. Employees have not been well prepared to have the honest and difficult conversations that emerge from inclusion and diversity initiatives. This is hard work. It's difficult, it can be uncomfortable. And knowing this, I feel like there's something almost disrespectful about not preparing people for this challenge. We are asking them to be vulnerable. We're asking them to share of themselves and we do need to prepare them. We need to honor their dignity. For those of the, uh, us who are on this journey together, we need to hone their ability to hear, but also be heard. So how do we see this journey then? Let's go back to that first insight we had, that inclusion are not problems to be solved, but rather a journey of growth and development. So we see this journey in three stages, each with clearly defined objectives um, and approach. So IND training is a journey comprising of three different stages, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, each with a different um, um, objective and approach. That first stage is about diversity. This is when we have a predetermined number of targets that can be reached, um, and companies can report visible diversity at all levels. Um, this is about compliance. This is a strategic move that the organization takes upon to often avoid negative consequences, whether that's internal pressure or an external pressure. This, we will say, is a necessary stage in the growth, but it's actually not sufficient. We mustn't stop here. So then what's the next stage? The next stage is about inclusion, where the objective, this is about getting more innovation. And how would we measure success? We know we can measure success because we know that people will contribute. There needs to be a high level of safety and appreciation that allows people to share their thoughts and ideas, even when they are risky or unpopular. So this notion of emotional safety within an organization is key. It's still strategic. It often recognizes the, uh, this is when the organization recognizes the benefit of um, IND initiatives, but they're still at the center of the story. Again, a very necessary stage, but not sufficient for full value. And that third stage is about belonging. The objective of belonging is to get higher levels of engagement, and how would we measure success? This is when people feel like they're being heard and valued, and that they are integrated into the organization. So we've kind of moved now from strategy, the first two stages are very strategic, and it's about the um, organization responding. So in the first one, they're responding with reports. On the second one, it's about the organization reaping the benefits. Thirdly, this is one when it moves from a strategic initiative to becoming a value within the organization. And how do we know it's a value? We know it's a value when people are engaged in this, uh, making decisions 
because it's the right thing to do. There's something intrinsic about it because it's a value that infuses throughout the organization. So let's just take a poll. What stage do you think best describes your organization's status with IND initiatives? Is it diversity, inclusion, or belonging? Okay, so we can see here where there is a variety of stages. 38% uh, feel like they're at the beginning of the journey, 50% are in the inclusion, and 13% believe that the value of in inclusion and diversity permeate throughout their organization. Excellent. Thank you so much. Michael, can you help us take a deeper dive in those other two insights? Yeah, thanks, Sunny. <clears throat> So the second key learning was that our job was to help prepare people for this journey so they do not default into defensiveness. So what do we really mean when we're talking about defensiveness? Well, in order to help you understand this, I want to introduce uh, a conceptual idea that we have called two operating systems. Now, all of you know what an operating system is. It's a set of instructions that essentially tells your computer how to behave. What many of you may not realize is your computer has a second operating system. It's called safe mode, and you boot into safe mode when your computer's under threat from a virus, from malware, from ransomware. And there's a real advantage to this. What it does is by protecting the system, it enables you to enact repairs before too much damage is done. The problem with it is that it makes your computer almost completely non-functional. This is an, a metaphor for how we talk about human beings, because we suggest that humans also have two operating systems, one which we call the defensive operating system, and the other is the heroic operating system. Let me give you a different example from nature. Now, many of you have probably never seen this type of tree before. It's called an acacia tree, and you'll find them if you live in the Southwest. They're also quite popular in South Africa, and I remember seeing these trees for the first time when I was on a safari. What was interesting to me is that while some of the trees were quite lovely and healthy, like this one is, some of them were really sort of ugly and scraggly looking, and they had big, gigantic thorns. And I was curious about this and I asked our guide why the difference in the trees. Well, what he said is that the inner bark of an acacia tree is quite tasty to rhinos and rhinoceroses. And so they'll come to the tree and they'll tear off, tear off or scrape off the bark, the outer bark so they can get to the under, underside of, the, uh, of that to eat. In response to this attack, the tree then grows these really strong, large thorns. And this is a way of understanding how human defensive operating systems work. Under threat or perceived threat, we tend to get prickly and grow thorns telling people to stay away. Now, avocado trees have quite a different response when they're under conditions of threat. Rather than growing thorns, under threat, avocados simply produce more fruit. It's as if the tree says, well, you may get me, but you're not gonna get all of us. Farmers, knowing this, actually tap little nails into the bark of avocado trees in order to increase their yield. So what can we say about the human defensive system? Well, we know that it's hardwired, and it's instinctual. You don't have to learn how to be defensive. We're born with this capacity to protect and defend ourselves. You may have heard of it at one point in your life 
as the fight or flight response. There's an additional response of freezing or shutting down, which can happen under conditions of threat. The defensive system is both physiological and behavioral in its outcomes. Alternatively, the heroic operating system has to be learned and freely chosen. It's based on human values and therefore needs culture and other human beings to come to fruition. People that are in their heroic operating system are inspired and inspiring to others. We see the heroic operating system as both psychological and spiritual in nature. Oftentimes when we work with our clients, they ask us, well, how would I know if I'm in my defensive or my heroic operating system? There's a couple of clues. If you find yourself blaming, judging, or criticizing another person, it's a pretty good bet you're in defensive. Once defended, you don't really listen. You're quite closed off and you get stuck in a particular perspective. From that perspective, you argue, rationalize, justify your own position, and often see other people as wrong. You see them as problem to be solved. And, and if you're in a position of leadership, that's often what triggers micromanagement. In this instance, people in defensive system usually tend to, see, to seek maximum rewards for very minimal effort. The key here is they're focusing only on me. A heroic operating system is different. It has a very different felt experience. It's calm, confident, creative, and connected to other people. There's genuine and generative dialogue and a real capacity for deep listening and curiosity. There's a willingness to share power and information. And because there's trust, we allow people to achieve results in their own ways. Importantly, people in the heroic operating system are responsive rather than reactive, and they accept accountability for their own choices. In the heroic operating system, there's a focus on we rather than me. Importantly, when we have conversations around inclusion and diversity, this can feel challenging to many people in their values and can unintentionally trigger them into defensiveness. It's the unintentional triggering that leads them to instinctively defend themselves and shut down or become critical. They defend their own position. Part of our work is to encourage them to get into their heroic operating system, to recognize what that feels like, thereby expanding their thinking and growing their mindsets to include other perspectives never considered. Importantly, each operating system not only informs our actions, it's not simply a behavioral system. It's a perceptual system that influences how we see and how we think. This is beautifully encapsulated by a quote attributed to Anais Nin. We don't see things as we are, we see things, I'm sorry, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. If that's the case, it becomes vitally important before asking people to step into workshops and to step into conversations about inclusion and diversity, that we prepare them to know how they're seeing and responding to the world. This leads us to our key learning number three. Do not try to change people's minds, but rather create conditions to expand their perspectives. This makes good sense in the context of the operating systems. If you ask someone to change their mind, you imply that they're wrong. That sense of being wrong triggers people into defensiveness. So let's check how you respond to differing perspectives. Take a look on the right side of your screen and let me know, do you see three or four planks? Well, the answer here is yes, depending on your perspective. Oftentimes in organizations, people being stuck in a perspective absolutely see something that's true, but they don't often have the largest picture and they confuse what's true with seeing the truth. 
Let's think about it another way. Let's imagine these two circles are someone's mindsets, the ways they think about and see the world. How many ways are there to make these circles overlap? Well, one way is we can bring the left over to the right. Now, the person on the right is going to love that because they don't have to change at all. Nothing's required for them. The person on the left is probably going to feel pretty uh, aggravated by this because the implication is they have to do all the work of change. So let's see what else we could do. Maybe we ask the person on the right, and this person will again be challenged to do all of the change while the person on the left feels pretty good that they didn't have to do anything. So perhaps what we do is ask people to actually compromise, move their own sense of beliefs in such a way that they come together. This can in many ways be worse because now both people are triggered into defensiveness, feeling like they have to change how they think and how they see the world. Either way, because someone else is asking you to change, we risk the possibility of reactivity and defensiveness. But there's another way that we've discovered. Rather than asking any one individual to change the way they think, we provide opportunities and experiences that help them expand outside of their core. And we call these circles of inclusion, right? Circles of engagement or even circles of empathy, helping recognize that I can still hold to my core beliefs and find ways that I overlap and intersect with yours. Now, I want to pause here from this idea and just move into the understanding uh, unconscious bias a bit because we often get questions, well, well, we do all kinds of bias training. Why isn't that working? Well, I don't want to say anything bad about unconscious buying, uh, bias. Um, I'm trained at, as an academic researcher, and, and I've reviewed this literature, and I think there's a lot of good things to recommend. I think that the, the work on unconscious bias is very well researched and thoughtful. And importantly, the findings are really robust and broadly applicable across a wide variety of organizations and, and cultures. Um, there's a real advantage to that, that the awareness of unconscious bias has the potential to destigmatize and normalize the topic, making it easier to discuss. I think we can all say at this point, all of us, by, by nature of the way our brains are designed, we all have unconscious bias. The problem is that simply having knowledge of the bias itself may not be sufficient to address the consequences of that bias. I'm going to come back to that point in a second. People may also assimilate the information in a way without thinking that they need to examine their own behavior or the broader consequences of their bias. And an intellectual understanding usually doesn't lead to empathy or change. So what do I mean by the consequences of bias? Well, let's imagine I walk into a room, my brain auto automatically categorizes the fact that I'm a man, and, and if I see women, I recognize they're different from me. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, and one could argue that recognizing that difference is a good thing. But the bias then goes farther, because then we start to attach values to those differences. It's not seeing the differences that the problem, that's the problem, it's the values we place upon them. And if we build upon those values with a set of policies and procedures and practices, then those biases become structural and institutionalized. So things like differences in pay scales, differences in hiring, and differences in promotability, those are things that are learned not things that are hardwired. The primary research on unconscious bias is really about cognitive biases. These are errors in judgment and decision making that we make. And when we focus only at that level, we miss these socially constructed 
and learned values. So if we're going to really address the inclusion and diversity issue, we then have to make sure that we move beyond understanding of the implicit bias, and we then begin to think about the structural and the process and the practices that have been influenced by that biases and, and in order to make a truly inclusive organization with a strong sense of belonging. It's only when we recognize that the social biases can be threatening and, trig and that they be trigger people into defensiveness that we can actually begin to engage them in a way that's honest um, and open. When we help people manage their biases and master their defensiveness, we help them remain heroic in such a way that they can hear more perspectives and they can attend to different information and they can sit better with discomfort. Great, thank you, Michael. Once, what's next? Now that we understand that we are reactive and that reactivity can impede our ability to have true dialogue with one another, what would come next after that? So we would suggest the following. If once you understand that you can become defensive, that things will trigger you, we would suggest a, a portion on mastering that defensiveness. How can you self-manage? There are biological elements that can give us clues to when we are about to be triggered. And once we can manage that reactivity, then we infuse the skills. The first skill that we would suggest is spending some time talking about listening, actually practicing listening. Um, listening that goes beyond um, just the superficial level, but truly to be engaged at a deep level with one another. Secondly, we would say flip that side coin over and then practice asking powerful questions. What we find in our classrooms are that people often default to low-level questions, uh, questions that are easily answered with yes or no, but rarely do they engage in the kind of questioning that expands thinking. But we can do it. We've seen it happen in class, um, that once people are given the skills to do it, that they easily um, can practice it with intention. And then as I mentioned before, because we are human beings, um, that it's pretty guaranteed that we're going to make a mistake in this journey. And that the importance is not that we made the mistake, but what can we learn about those mistakes? And that how can we recover um, ourselves and repair that broken relationship? So before we move on to the question and answer section, let's take a quick poll, shall we? Um, because a, a lot of this can generate um, next level thinking. So what are you most interested in, interested in? Are you interested in knowing how do I get buy-in from all levels in the organization? Or are you interested in how do I move IND from a strategic um, position to a value in my organization? What about transforming from compliance and inclusion to belonging? How do we manage reactivity? Or are you interested in all of the above? And here are our poll results. All right. So, I guess we've hit some buttons here. <laughs> we know that um, for many of you, a majority of you, that there's a lot of questions, a lot of areas to explore, um, and we are more than happy to help you with that. So with that, let's go on, and if you do we have any um, questions from the audience? Now, one of the questions that often comes up, and I see it's right here too, is um, what are some of the results? How do you know that this is working? That um, I think about one of our clients that we work with, and we've been working with them since uh, 2007. And a part of our work, we've done um, surveys. 
And back in 2007, this organization's um, employees were asking for, in the areas of improvement, they wanted to see improvement in certain areas. 68% um, of employees in this organization wanted to see an improvement in fairness. Fairness is one of the categories um, that's often associated with IND um, initiatives. And I'm happy to say since 2007, that 68% um, looking for areas of fairness improvement has dropped to single digits. So we know that the work we're, that we've been doing in that organization for these many years has um, had an impact on people's perception of fairness. Do we have all right. Okay, we have another question here, um, which is, um, how do I ensure that people have those kinds of hard conversations? What are the things we need to do? Okay, I think one of the things we have to make sure is safety is the key. Having emotional safety in a room, um, which is set up by a facilitator, is often a good best practice. And what I mean by safety is it's good to include things like guidelines for discussion. It's good to include making sure that every person has a say. And it's also good, but probably most important, is that when somebody says um, a controversial comment, that we manage our reactivity. That once they discover that, um, that what they said is controversial or um, that people are against what they're saying, they will automatically shut down. They will either shut down or, like Michael um, said before, they will get super defensive and dig in their heels. Right. Sunny, I have, all the, yes, please, Michael. Uh, I, have a, I have a question here. And it says, how do you help organizations sustain the learning experience? So this is where we see inclusion and diversity as part of a larger leadership development journey. Um, if, if inclusion and diversity is, is kind of stuck off into a corner and it doesn't have a budget, people are largely um, contributing to those efforts on a volunteer basis, uh, it, it communicates to the rest of the organization that they're not really serious about moving inclusion and diversity into the value space. Maybe they'll have some procedures in, in hiring or interviewing, um, but people recognize when that's not really authentic. So what you have to do is you have to have leadership really buy in to this and they have to participate in the training and they have to want and see the value of inclusion and diversity as part of a leadership's um, a, or leader's responsibility in the organization. So we mentioned that a, a leader's role is to create the conditions for people to expand their perspectives. Um, you can't force them to do it, that was one of our learnings. But the more that leaders create opportunity for those dialogues and, and create safe space and create opportunity to bring in diverse perspectives, the more likely it is to spread through the organization. Thank you, Michael. Um, that's all the time we have right now for questions. Um, Let's do a summary of where we've been. Oops. Let me go back. There we go. Okay. So three key learnings and insights. Inclusion and diversity are not problems to be solved, but a journey of growth and development. Um, again, not about checking off boxes or following rules, but really engaging with your audience, with your employees, um, to see, to learn from them, give them the opportunity to speak up and help forge this journey. Um, people need to be prepared. Let's not assume that they have the skills or can manage their reactivity um, in this space. And let's think about how we might move away from trying to change people's minds, but rather creating those conditions in which their um, perspectives are expanded. Um, I've heard of a couple of analogies to describe this journey. I like to use the coffee analogy. I'll be honest, I'm a coffee drinker. So that first stage about diversity um, and being able to report our numbers, that's the first cup of beans, literally counting the beans, 
what kind of beans do you have? Do you have, you know, from Italy? Do you have from Ethiopia? You can measure it. You can count it out. But they're separate, yet they have great potential. That second stage of inclusion, you know, people are starting to work together. They're, they've been grounded together. They've forged relationships. And we're starting to see things move and change and start, but they're not quite fully integrated. And that third stage of belonging, this is about when you can truly um, appreciate the lusciousness of the smell and the taste of a really good brew of coffee. So if we look at this journey um, and how we can uh, move from stage to stage, this is really about interactions. It starts at that first stage. The quality of interactions increases at the second stage. And by the third stage, we do it because it's almost natural and the right thing for us to do. And if you would like more information and want to reach us and have questions that we didn't get to answer during the course of this webinar, please feel free to email us. Um, tomorrow, you, we will be sending out the links and the slides to the webinar. And feel free to share them with your colleagues or anyone else you think might benefit from getting some of our perspectives. So we say goodbye for now. Stay tuned for more webinars from Lapin International, and we'll see you on the web. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate Thank your you. logging in.